Welcome to a new video. Now, if you want to watch the why am I over here with a loading thing that doesn't want to stop at all because YouTube is like that with a gravestone because I saw Game Theory upload a new fun of his video and um, mm. <laughs> I wanted to do something else, but then when I came on to YouTube, I immediately saw it and I thought, hmm, I should do a reaction to this. Probably should do that. Let's start. Hello, my channel. Oh, hello, Spade. Hello. Wow. Is this supposed to be William with Remnant? Yes, it is. It's alive. It's oh, alive. Boy. It's. It's dead. <laughs> Rip Matt Matt. If in the chat, please, or if whatever. Hello, Internet. Welcome to Game Theory, where today we're covering the scariest topic in all of FNAF lore the timeline. <laughs> but not for the games. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez, no, I hate myself, but not that much. Whew, I'll probably have to do that at some point down the line, but not today. Um, no, what we're covering today is a different timeline. You see, there's the a books? new monster afoot in the FNAF universe. A killer that... <gasps> Vinny, right? That's her name, I think. ...taking the lives of nearly a dozen people. A killer has yet well, been seen in the games, but uh, one who will, after today's theory, provide us with key insights... Go on, Freddy. ...this whole FNAF universe works. The true nature... Scott Gawthon, or is it Mark? I don't know. ...of Remnant and how ghosts can possess endoskeletons. As I said, he hasn't been in a game yet, but I have a feeling he'll be showing up soon. Maybe as soon as the new Scott game is in reach. But in order to know for sure, it's our job to track his movements, to understand what his goals are, and where he's headed to next. You see, last FNAF Theory, we did a surface-level analysis of 1.35 a.m., uh -huh. the latest installment of the Fazbear Fright series. Mm -hmm. And boy, was that one a biggie, with huge revelations about sister location, ultimate custom knights of vengeful mm -hmm. spirit and the real identity or should i say identities of golden freddy and looking back since the fazbear frights books became a thing i've done five theories on them covering <laughs> many many connections that they have to the various facets of fnaf lore from new strings of murders happening in 1985 to the true identity of psychic friend fred bear but despite all of this yeah. new fnaf talk there's been one element i've largely been glossing over the stitch wraith in the event that you haven't picked up any of the installments of the book series yet, let me catch you up. Each new book contains three short stories, right? That's the selling feature. It's what's advertised on the back of the yep. box, so to speak. But each one also comes with a bit of a bonus. In reality, each book is more like three and a fifth stories. You see, each one ends with an epilogue, our little MCU post-credits teaser giving us a piece of yet another story. The tale of the Stitch Wraith, a story that appears to be spanning out across the ending of each and every book in this new series. So, other words, the, um... Part one, part two, part three, part four, part five, put them all together, you get a story. And that alone would be pretty darn cool, right? Also, it's a brilliant marketing tactic to keep us buying more just to see the end of this thing. Slow That's clap, true. Scott Cawthon. Slow clap. But That's three true. segments in, and it's becoming clear that the tale of the Stitch Wraith isn't just another horror tale. It's instead a running thread throughout nearly every other shorter story that we've been reading through, which in turn seems to connect it both to the original trilogy of books as well as even the games. So okay. in order to to understand what this thing is and where the lore is headed, it's time to go Easter egg hunting for a monster. Mm. Now, admittedly, my first theory on the Fazbear Frights books briefly covered the Stitch Wraith, and uh, back then I assumed he was entered. The Wraith was described in that book as a mysterious figure wearing a black cloak and wearing a white mask with features drawn in thick black marker. The True. description specifically calls out his two eyes, one of which appears to be blacked out, a big toothy grin with blood around the mouth and a limping or shambling walk. White mask, blacked out eye, shamble, shamble, shake. It seems like a slam dunk for Enter. But the mouth. The epilogue for 1.35 a.m. threw that hypothesis know. out the window as it revealed just exactly how the Stitch Wraith was brought to life. A process that actually reveals a lot about how this series' mythos works. In this epilogue, we're introduced to Dr. Phineas Taggart, not to be confused with his friend Dr. Ferb Fletcher. Phineas is a bit of a mad well. scientist type, studying the untapped power of human emotion as he says himself quote human emotion is slower to impact 
more insidious. It emanates from us, or is excreted from us like sweat or tears, and it wafts outward like a noxious cloud soaking into the surroundings. In particular, his research is centered around the intense emotion of agony. In order to study it, we see that Phineas collects hundreds of haunted objects to search for this emotion trapped inside. Again from the book, the word haunted could mean showing signs of torment or some kind of mental anguish. These items on Phineas's shelves weren't possessed by ghosts. The ones that were truly haunted were energized by agony. Agony, I'm convinced, radiates farther from people than any other emotion, Phineas said. My work is focused on my hypothesis that you can take a saturation of agony, add any sort of intelligence, even an artificial one, and they'll combine together to transmute the energy of emotion into the energy of physical action. This, I believe, is what explains what people call haunted objects. And already you might be starting to see how this all ties into what yep. we already know about this franchise. In FNAF 6's Insanity Ending, we were introduced to the blueprints outlining how the sister location Scooper worked, and it was, well, it, it was not what we expected, to nope. say the least. Through those blueprints, we learned about the mystery metal called Remnant, and its ability to supposedly give life to objects that it touches. The novel The Fourth Closet took it one step further and showed us the Remnant metal being created and used. In that story, we watch as William Afton melts down pieces of the old animatronics, creating a Remnant soup that he then uses to give life to new living robots, specifically the Funtime animatronics. Yeah, I... Quote, on the heating table rested the endoskeletons of the original Freddy's animatronics, welded and melted together, immobile and featureless, and still inhabited by the spirits of the children who had been murdered inside of them so many years ago, still filled with life and motion and thought, all trapped, all in terrible pain. Usually this goes into something mechanical, something I made, William said. If we remember back to Candy Cadet's stories of five things always becoming one thing, five kittens getting sewn together, or five keys melted down into one, this is exactly what those stories were referring to. But Phineas's experiments in 1.35am actually take it one step further and give us more insight into the true nature of Remnant. Things that are brought to light via Remnant aren't necessarily infused with a soul, but instead with agony, with intense human emotion, with extreme human suffering. This is important because it means that characters like Balloon Boy, the Bitty Babs and the Mini Renas and Sister Location, heck, even animatronics like Mangle don't necessarily need to have actual victims associated with them. We used to look at solving the mysteries of this series as having it be one-to-one -one all the time. Susie equals Chica, Charlie equals the puppet, Cassidy equals Golden Freddy. But what we're starting to learn is that there are other ways to bring things to life in this series, that some animatronics may contain multiple souls, like we talked about last time with Golden Freddy, and some might not contain any souls at all. So as in long active as fact, in active fact, um... How many souls are there? <laughs> How many there are? That's the question. Go back to square one and count. Go back to grade two to count. It always goes back to some extreme tragedy Probably. filled with this all powerful emotion of agony. So with that little analysis in place, let's go back to our story. We see Phineas collect objects associated with horrific tragedies, and via some means, funnel all the agony from them down into an endoskeleton, which we're specifically told is meant to be a stand-in for bones, so we're talking like a FNAF 1 or FNAF 2 era endoskeleton here. Phineas yep. then puts right. the head of a large three-foot doll on it, a doll whose description bears a shocking similarity to blank, from, actually, from the finally, fan game Five yeah. Nights at Candy's, and finally a battery pack before turning this beast on. And and not and only does this modern Frankenstein come to life, it immediately kills its creator, Phineas, seemingly by accident, surprisingly, and then runs off, hiding under a black cloak. The Stitch Wraith has been born. But, okay, why am I making such a big deal out of this thing? Why does this guy deserve his own episode? Well, because solving the Stitch Wraith story in these books is like a game unto itself. You see, there have been very subtle clues hidden throughout the nine other stories in this series that connect things back to the Stitch Wraith. My first clue was the battery pack Phineas uses to power the Stitch Wraith as he's building it. Because it's not just any battery pack. It came from Fetch, the murder animatronic dog from book two of the series. Oh Quote, my. the item in the second box was an animatronic dog that clearly no longer functioned. The dog was an ugly dog, with a triangle-shaped head and a wide mouth full of sharp teeth. In minutes, he'd revealed the dog's battery pack. So immediately we know that the Stitch Wraith story is happening after the events of the Fetch story from book number two. So I dug around deeper and more connections kept coming. Earlier in this same book, 
In the title story 1.35 a.m. about the haunted Eladal, there's one line referencing a man named Phineas looking online for a particular toy. Quote again, One of the searches for special Eladal led her to an online ad posted by a user named Phineas who was trying to find one of the dolls. His ad referenced the special Eladal and said he was willing to pay a premium for the doll's energy. Overall, across the nine stories published so far, seven seem to tie back to the Stitch Wraith, allowing us to create hmm. a rough timeline of events. So bear with me as we go through this. We know that 1.35 a.m. and Fetch must come first because Phineas is alive and looking for the Ella doll like I just mentioned, and the evil robot dog has just started his murder spree. From there comes the story we just covered, Epilogue 3 and the Stitch Wraith's creation. After that, he begins to roam the city collecting body parts for some purpose. You may remember book number one story, To Be Beautiful, in which Baby hacks mm. apart a human girl named Sarah in order to steal her identity. Sarah is rebuilt out of junk, only for her to fall to pieces at the end. Well, in epilogue number one, we hear that the Stitch Wraith was seen collecting those junk pieces of Sarah. Odd, right? And it's not the only time that it happens either. In book number two, there's the story Out of Stock, about a group of friends who steal a defective plush trap doll, one with oddly human-like eyes and teeth, only for it to go on a rampage. The boys manage to escape by luring it in front of an oncoming train where it gets shattered to pieces. And again, in epilogue number two, we see the Stitch Wraith on the scene salvaging whatever he can find of the broken box. And that's where it would seem to end if it weren't for one other small detail. You see, in one of the other stories like in this what? book, Room for One More, about a security guard being force-fed mini Rena dolls in the basement of Circus like Baby's that. Entertainment like that. Rentals, there's Still a like passing that. reference to a restaurant called The Snack Space. Hey man, I was picking up a takeout order at Luigi's the other night and saw your ex on a date with the manager of The Snack Space. Seems... Super unimportant, right? Well, it would be if this was the only time that it was mentioned, but it's popped up in one of the other stories. In Into the Pit, the very first story, the one about the time-traveling ball pit, the snack space is where the protagonist's father works, which means that Circus Baby's Entertainment and Rentals sister location is also in that world, which in turn connects it to one final story, Count the Waves, where we see an old, broken, Funtime Freddy planning to execute a girl trapped inside of his stomach. And while these aren't necessarily directly tied to the Stitch Wraith, it certainly feels like at some point all of these stories will come together, as though we're working on chunks of a larger puzzle. We've got a uh... big chunk over here that's the Stitch Wraith connections, and a big chunk over here that's all connected through Sister Location and the Snack Space, and then you have a few other random pieces over here, and by the end, I expect all of them will come together. So, assuming that they are all connected, the timeline seems to go about like this. Lonely Fred the story about the kids getting mind swapped with mini Freddy dolls has to be mm -hmm. first because it's the only one of these stories so far where Fazbear locations are open and ready for business. At some point, Freddy Fazbear's closes, leading to room for one more about the underground facility filled with mini Rena's hoping to escape, which would parallel what we hear in Sister Location. Due to the massive success yes. and even more so the unfortunate uh, closing of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, it was clear that the stage was set, no pun intended, for another contender in children's entertainment. At some point, Baby and the Mini Renas escape from that underground facility. That's an amazing model. At 5 a.m., with Phineas looking for the haunted doll, and Greg activating the murder dog in an abandoned Freddy Fazbear's in Fetch. From there, the next major moment is Stitch Wraith's creation in Epilogue 3, which then leads to his quest for body parts in To Be Beautiful Epilogue 1 and Out of Stock Epilogue 2. We also know that Into the Pit and The New Kid happen near the end of the timeline, since they both feature a closed-down, forgotten, or repurposed Freddy's building. Also, there's Count the Ways, which which is towards the end of this timeline, grouped with these other stories, since a retired Funtime Freddy is just randomly sitting in a garage killing kids. What does all of this tell us? What was the purpose of doing all this work? Well, first, all of this seems to connect us pretty solidly into the book trilogy. The fact that we have an Ella doll infused with agony that Phineas wants his hands on perfectly matches the Ella doll that Henry made for his daughter, Charlie. To quote from the fourth closet, agony erupted, flooding the room with its sound. A man lay curled on the floor something cradled tightly in his arms, and when his mouth opened, the room shook with the sound of his anguish. Who is that? Charlie said anxiously. What is he holding? You don't recognize her? Elizabeth said. That's Ella, of course. It's all your father had left after you were taken. He cried over that cheap store-bought rag doll for two months, cried into it, bled into it, poured his grief over it, end quote. At which point, he makes the robotic Ella doll that we talked about in the last episode. So what we're seeing in these stories appears to be, at least to some mm. extent, 
the aftermath of that trilogy of books. Which also Looks means like that it. we might already know the true identity of the Stitch Wraith. It's a bit of a long shot, but it's my personal headcanon until proven otherwise. I think that the endoskeleton that powers the Stitch Wraith, the main body that's become the conduit for all of this agony, is the Is you! <laughs> It's you, and of course it's gonna be you. The same endoskeleton that killed Henry. The robot that he used to end his own life. The stabbing robot, which, let's yep. be honest, is like the most complicated way to do that sort of thing. Like, build a robot to stab you to death? What? Wow. Creative types, man, they are weird. Anyway, we're told in the Silver Eyes that it's a basic Gen 1 endoskeleton with an unfinished face. Which would explain oh exactly why Phineas needs to put a head on I should read those books again. Eyes, she could see its face. If it could be called a face, its features were scarcely formed, crude and shapeless. Its blind eyes were only raised bumps like the eyes of a statue, seeing nothing but its own grief. We also know that this endoskeleton would be absolutely filled to the brim with agony. I mean, it as far would. as endoskeletons go, a murder bot built by a grieving father is a pretty huge deal. And it's apparently an important enough character to this franchise to have also appeared at the end of the book trilogy, when Charlie is being attacked by baby, it's this same murder oh, wow. bot and its trusty knife that Charlie uses to do them both in. I have a very, very strong theorist instinct that the Stitch Wraith will, at some point during this book series, be revealed to be connected back to Henry and his bizarre death. Just saying, the pieces are in place for us. Really? Oh really? yeah, and assuming that the Fazbear Fright series is connected a bit closer to the book trilogy, like it appears to be, we know that book five, Bunny Call, features a story about a man with gruesome burns over his body and an iron will to live. I mean, we already really? suspected that that was William Afton, really? but going back to see how his story ended in the fourth closet, we see that his death is far from certain. In his final moments, his hospital gown catches fire and he's pulled into a massive furnace. But then, nothing. No official confirmation that that burning actually kills him. Therefore, a burned man in a hospital who refuses to die sounds like a certain yellow bunny we all know who hmm. always comes back. Let's be honest, well, William has been through a lot. He's been through a lot. Come on. He has been springlocked. He's been almost, you know, getting his butt stabbed. He's been burnt. He's been, um, you know, taken out of the springlock suit. He's been burnt again. He's gone through a lot. If you think of it, when you think of it, so he's got the iron will to live. I'll give you that. But bloody hell, I am sorry for his wife that has to go through. You know, if he if she pushes him, oh well, she's dead. And with that, I think oh, I've had enough FNAF for now. Oh man, it has been a lot. The new book comes out in early July, so at the very yep. least, I get a break for a couple of weeks. Thank goodness. No. That. No. No. And also leaks as well. Man, I am a little on edge these days. 2020 has really started to mess with my head. I need to relax. But I've Netflix. seen all of this, literally everything on every streaming platform. If only there was something new to watch. Wait, can it be? Our sponsor for today's episode. Is he gonna talk about place sponsorships and anything else about this Honda video? Yep, apparently it is. Oh well, that's the end for this video. Yep, because it's gonna be a Honda sponsorship now. That's always gonna be. So that's the books, apparently. And then you also got the leak, and then you also got the movie thing, which I did a video on. We got the movie. There's the you know confirmation by J Jason Blum, I think that's his name. And then you also got the leaks of the toy or the figurine diggly diggly and also minis as well. That will be that will be discussed in another video which I should upload. I probably should. But I'm a dumb. I'm the dumb. So I don't think I will upload today. Well. It all depends. But hope you enjoyed this. Um, check out this video as well. Subscribe to Game Theorist. Do that. And thank you to the people that joined the live stream as well. Thank you also to the person that donated. With that, I will talk to that in a different video. But now I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next video. Goodbye, everyone. I should say it again. Goodbye, everyone. That's a lot better.